company. Okay, so today we are going to start with this particular topic of accounts of the company and negotiable instrument act. After completing this accounts topic, we will start with the negotiable instrument act. Okay, so the main aspects of this particular topic, accounting of the companies. As we all know, books of accounts, what are books of accounts? They are like a PL account, balance sheet, and uh, which you all uh, know, financial statements, uh, which you prepare in your accounting topic. These books of accounts are prepared by the board of directors of the company, and they're responsible and authorized person of the board of the directors will sign those books of accounts, and they will mean to keep these particular books of accounts in the registered office of the company, okay? Under section from 128 uh, to 138, there are different sections which we need to deal in this particular topic. <clears throat> so let us go one by one. What are, as, as I have already mentioned you, these books of accounts will ensure the true and fair, correct financial statements, correct information about the company, day-to-day -day transactions, and regarding the expenses, regarding the incomes of the company, assets, libraries, everything are measured in this particular books of accounts, and they need to be prepared by the board. And once they are prepared by the board, they are audited by the statutory auditors of the company, and they are laid after getting audited and signed by the statutory auditors, only audited financial statements are laid in the AGM for the <clears throat> shareholders to know the financial portion of the company every year. Okay. Now, ma'am, where these books of accounts are kept? Once these priorities are prepared by the uh, board of directors, where they are kept? They are kept in the registered office of the company. Okay. So please do remember the books of accounts are kept at the registered office. And how they prepare these books of accounts, they may, these are important points for bits. And the books of accounts are prepared on accrual basis and double entry system of accounting. Ca according to the provisions of Companies Act 2013, cash maintenance of books of accounts on cash basis is not valid. You need to maintain only on accrual basis <clears throat> and they are kept at the registered office of the company. First, suppose if the company want to keep the books of accounts at a place other than the registered office in India, they can do that. Before doing that, they need to pass a board resolution and intimate the same within seven days after passing a board resolution. the registered office of the company they are, they are um, like maintained on equal basis and double entry system but these books of accounts if the company want to keep the books of accounts at a place other than the registered office they need to pass initially the board resolution take the uh, take the approval of all the directors and intimate the same within a period of seven days in a prescribed form form number AOC 5 to ROC okay once after intimating to ROC they can keep it any other place ma'am you can ask what is the reason why the company wants keep it any place other than the register office say sometimes for few, few companies and the register office might be in backward areas like in villages or in some small towns where it is very difficult for the third parties or for some other to access these books of accounts okay for the starter you have to access the books of accounts therefore in such cases uh, where the register office is in some uh, uh, like uh, in a remote area in in that particular case the books of accounts are kept in, in any other place where it is accessible to everyone like in cities towns etc at a place other than the registered office okay so these are the important aspects regarding the books of accounts under section 128 next ma'am if suppose the company is having uh, uh, i mean like it's having branches at different places uh, in such cases uh, the books of accounts related to the bank transactions are also kept at their own branches and uh, uh, time to time the summarized reports are sent periodically to the registered office of the company okay so if the company is having any local branches or foreign branches uh, the books of accounts of those local branches and foreign branches are kept in their branch accounts and summarized reports and quarterly on quarterly intervals or uh, monthly or fortnightly are sent to the registered office and which are kept to the directors for the inspection. These books of accounts can also be maintained. It is not mandatorily that they should be maintained in electronic form, but they can be maintained even in the electronic form also. Which, but the system of uh, but the system for storage, retrieval, display, and printout of these electronic records should be proper. And they should also specify the name of service proper provider, internet protocol address of service provider, location of service, all these details should also be mentioned 
check to the ROC regarding if the books of accounts are maintained in an electronic form. Okay. Now, next very important uh, case is if these books are kept in the register office, ma'am, is it accessible for the members of the company to inspect the books of accounts? So once again, I'm telling, is it accessible for the members of the company to inspect the books of accounts? No, the members of the company cannot or should not inspect the books of accounts. Only directors or their agent, if he is authorized person, can inspect the books of accounts. Okay. So once again, I'm telling you, very important point, and it's important for the practical case law. Are uh, do the members are allowed for the inspection of books of accounts no members are not allowed for the inspection of books of accounts members of the company then who are allowed ma'am the directors can inspect the books of accounts or any other person who is authorized as an agent on behalf of the director with respect to uh, power of attorney he can inspect the books of account if there is no objection okay so inspection can be done only of books of accounts and papers connected there in case any person requires it but on the member Okay, other than a director, if he was generally, company sack does not allow him to inspect the books of accounts. If he want to inspect the books of accounts, he need to take the approval of tribunal or the court according to the famous case law. Okay, so these are the important aspects. So we have seen what are books of accounts, where to keep these books of accounts, or a register office or any other place. And is the inspection of the books of accounts is possible by the members or the board of directors? We have seen that particular uh, aspect clearly. Next very important thing is financial statements. As we have already seen initially under section 240 of the company sign, financial statement in relation to a company includes balance sheet, PL account, cash flow statement, uh, and uh, any other statement of changes in equity and explanatory statement related date to. Okay, as we all know, the financial statements are nothing but balance sheets, PL account, in case of non profit organization, it is income and expenditure account, cash flow statements, or statements of changes in equity and explanatory statement related there to. But in case of one person company, small company, dormant company, they will not include uh, the cash flow statements. Okay, cash flow statements are not included as a part of. Of financial statements under section 1 uh, 240 therefore there's one person company small company dormant company just financial statements means balance sheet and PL account but not the cash flow statement okay so these are the important aspects what are the financial statement what they give they give a true and fair picture of the company's FIs and whether they should be prepared or they should be prepared in such a way that they, the accounting standards which are notified under 133 should be properly comply, compiled with by the company and they are also prepared as per the procedures or forms specified in the schedule 3 of the company's act. So once again I am telling you these financial statements will reflect the true and fair view of the FIs of the company and they should be prepared by following the account necessary accounting standards which are applicable to the company under section 133 and they should also be provided how in the what format these accounts have to be prepared. They have to be prepared according to the schedule 3 of the company's act. Okay, So these are the important aspects when you are preparing the accounting and financial statements. If there are any deviations for the company while they are preparing um, the financial statement, they should specifically mention uh, this particular aspect have been deviated in their financial statements. However, these requirements are not applicable. The provisions of Companies Act 2013 are not applicable. Uh, you need not follow these accounting standards or should prepare in the specific form of Schedule 3 of the Companies Act to these companies because there are statutory companies and they are guided by their own statutory separate act. Therefore, they specifically mention that these requirements are not applicable to insurance companies or banking companies or companies engaged in supply of electricity or any other companies as notified by the central government. For these, they have their own separate act which is applicable. Therefore, the provisions of the Companies Act is not applicable at the time of preparation of the financial statements. Okay. I have already said I have the separate. And they, I have already intimated you initially that in this finance, the company have to disclose if there is any deviation from the accounting standards, reasons for such deviation, why you could not apply that specific accounting standard to that particular provision, and what are the financial effect or financial impact on this particular financial position of the company because of such deviation. Okay, this is man, each company should, oh, if there is such deviation, should specifically mention as a note or intimate in their financial. 
statements otherwise it would be considered financial statements are would be considered as ill, 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 irregular and void so it is mandatory why why uh, those accounting standards have not been properly implemented what are the deviations and what is the impact of financial impact of the deviation on the financial portion of the company once the board of directors have prepared these financial statements uh, and they, they have signed the financial statements and they will present these financial statements uh, in agm by the end of the financial year on the day on which the agm is conducted so at every agm the board of directors will lay these financial statements okay so it's important only these or these financial statements and one more thing and the financial statements after preparation by board of directors directly they don't go to the uh, shareholders only after they get audited by the auditors only audited financial statements are verified by the shareholders okay so this is very 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 important point so uh, so once they are prepared they need to be signed by the pro proper authority and after signing the pro proper authority they should be proper properly audited or verified by the auditors statutory auditors of the company okay next important point ma'am suppose uh, if a company is having subsidiaries or associates uh, in such cases uh, the company have to prepare its own financial statements as well as consolidated financial statements along with the subsidiaries and associates uh, and the same should be presented at the agm so it is mandatory it is important for the companies to prepare its, its own financial statements as well as kind of consolidated financial statements if the company is having one or more subsidiaries or associate companies and lay before the agm how a central government means uh, may uh, sometimes uh, uh, require certain class or class of unlisted public companies uh, to prepare the financial results on periodical basis as and when they require sometimes the company the, uh, the central government will ask a few unlisted public companies to give their uh, financial statements uh, as and when required by them for the some for some of the reasons okay now next one is uh, central government may also exempt certain class or class of companies from preparation or from pro, uh, from uh, applying certain rules of companies act and uh, companies act 2013 okay if suppose if the company fails to comply with the above provision set uh, under companies act then company and its officers are liable for penalty for non compliance under section 129 of the companies act the managing director full time director or the person who is in charge of finance chief financial officer, officers or any other person authorized by the board are liable for penalty if they fail to prepare the financial statements uh, uh, properly which, uh, which reflects the true and fair you or if they fail to comply with accounting standards and if the deviations are not mentioned in the financial statements in such cases they are liable for the penalty okay so next uh, uh, there is a one separate uh, authority in, uh, that is national financial reporting authority uh, this particular authority is responsible for for timely uh, verification of accounting standards and preparation of these uh, accounting standards and, uh, and, uh, and seeing that they are properly implemented to the companies and the companies are also properly following uh, these standards okay their responsibility they establish a high quality standards of accounting and auditing uh, for the performance for the effective performance accounting performance and auditing performance by the auditors and accounting performance of the companies okay they provide a high quality standards for the accounting this is an authority which is authorized by the central government this is a branch of central government authority okay and what is this they will maintain details of auditors who are for especially for the government auditors for said that they will appoint the auditors and they are responsible for them and to see that proper regular audit have been some uh, i mean conducted okay so this is all about uh, nfra uh, which is nothing but uh, the national financial reporting authority next Central government sometimes under Section 133 will prescribe certain accounting standards which are applicable to certain type of companies. Central government will prescribe the standards of accounting sir, as recommended by the ICAI uh, and when consulting with the recommendations made by NFRA also. Okay, so central government uh, time to time will uh, will uh, try to uh, I mean uh, prescribe to accounting standards to certain class of companies as recommended to them by said ICAI and NFRA. Okay, so now next very important thing as i have already told you this particular final who should sign the financial statements very 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 important sometimes this particular provision is also asked in a practical question i will also let you know in what way the practical question will be asked for this particular topic okay the financial statements uh, should be they they should be once they are prepared by the board of directors uh, and after preparation of these financial statements that is a uh, 
uh, consolidated financial statements also they should be signed by the following person if they, they in case of a chairman a chairman of the company if he is authorized by the board and uh, by two directors out of which one person is a managing director compulsory there should be a chairman of the board and that particular chairman will sign or who is authorized by the board and out of two directors one person will be a managing director okay so other than that uh, if the company is having a ceo cfo company secretary if they are appointed by the company mandatorily they should also sign okay the ceo of the company have to sign the cfo have to sign and the company secretary if he is appointed by the company however in case of one person company these financial statements are signed by only one director remember this particular point okay see suppose in examination practical question if they say for the financial statements of pqr limited uh, is signed by the chairperson who is authorized by the board and the managing director of the company however the company is also having company secretary who is appointed by the company but he did not sign the financial statements in such case is it valid or not then what you have to say according to the provisions of companies act 134 the financial statements uh, before submitting the financial statements after preparation of financial statement and before submitting them to the auditor for the audit purpose the financial statements have to be authenticated or have to be signed by the chairperson who is appointed by the board and by the directors two directors one of whom should be a managing director and if the company is having ceo or cfo or company secretary mandated they all should sign the financial statements if these people if any of these persons fails to sign up then the uh, the financial statements are not considered to be valid okay so this is an important practical question area which we will ask for your examination now circulation of these financial statements not as i have already told you the financial statements once they are signed and authenticated by the board they should be immediately sent to the auditor okay so the audit uh, one only after they are audited by the auditor the audited financial statements um, have to be read before the agm or circulated to the members before at least 21 days before the meeting okay now along with this financial statements what are the other reports which are connected or which are attached to this financial statement are auditors report board report are also attached with the financial statements and they all put together are laid in the agm okay next one now is it is it a right of members to take copies of audited financial statements the copies of audited financial statements including consolidated financial statements audit report and any other documents which are attached to the financial statements uh, and they can receive before the agm at least 21 days before the meeting or in case of section 8 companies 14 days before the meeting i have already told you okay so what are the things which can be Uh, uh which can be verified or which can be taken by members of the company are consolidated audited financial statements if the company is having more than one uh, subsidiary or branches or just a copy of audited financial statements audit report board report or any other document attached to the financial statements okay so uh, the document shall be sent at least 21 days before the meeting so it is like even along with the notice uh, under section 101 of the company act which we have discussed previously in the general meetings topic okay along with it, this particular documents are also and they will check and chair members of the company will verify and they will accordingly they will present in the meeting particular for uh, decide uh, for the purpose of uh, deciding on the ordinary business matters like adoption of the financial statements uh, declaration of the dividend appointment of auditors uh, fixing the remuneration and appointment of a retiring i'm um, appointment of a director you know for all this discussion of ordinary business matters they will come to the hm and they will pass a resolutions okay however if sometimes the company can also can also circulate these documents for a lesser period of 21 days uh, in such cases uh, a 95 percentage of members who are present in the meeting either during the meeting before the meeting or after the meeting should accept for the lesser period of time uh, then it would be valid otherwise company is liable for the punishment and once these are prepared once these are audited they are kept in the registered office of the company therefore it is every member of the company trustees holders debenture holders can inspect during the business hours of the company okay so these are the general points relating to it and in case of uh, uh, suppose uh, that uh, in case of listed companies uh, if at all uh, the company need to circulate give the copies of this document or circulate these documents along with the uh, notice they can also do so and place the same with the registered office of the company okay 
and these listed companies in in soft giving all these uh, through the notice they can also place in their website so it will be accessible for everyone to verify these at uh, an audited financial statements or audited financial or consolidated financial statements okay so once these are prepared once they are audited the copy of it this of these uh, financial statements including financial finance consolidated financial statements and all the necessary documents uh, have to be filed to roc within 30 days from the date of agm Okay, so remember these documents, all the necessary documents, along with the audited financial statements, uh, should be filed to ROC within 30 days from the date of AGM. Okay, it's very very important in prescribed form they should uh, file it to the ROC. Okay. Suppose, ma'am, if suppose the financial statements are not adopted, are not prepared, are not audited on the day of AGM, then what will happen? Only for the purpose of adoption of these financial statements, the AGM might be adjourned. But uh, the same thing, uh, the probably in such cases, if it is not adopted in the first AGM, uh, then in such cases, the company have to file a provisional financial statements to the ROC. Then uh, once they are once their audit is completed and once they are laid in the adjourned AGM, after the AGM thirty days, the final uh, adopted financial statements have to be filed to the ROC. So this is one one more important point which I am telling here. Suppose if the company could not adopt the financial statements in the AGM. in such cases sir the company should file a provisional financial statements sir to the roc after the date of original ac then in, in for the purpose of adoption of the financial statement the meeting have been adjourned and in the adjourned meeting they they adopted the financial statement audited financial statements and in such cases sir the company should file within 30 days from the date of agm to the roc the adopted financial statements okay so these are the important points which you need to keep in mind if suppose the company fails to conduct an agm in In such case, the same have to be intimated to the ROC, the ROC that the company because of so and so reasons. Uh, see, last two years we had COVID because of that company could not conduct its AGM. So like that, the company have to specify the reasons uh, within thirty days from the date of AGM that the company could not conduct the AGM. Okay, so these are the important points. Along with the financial statements, the company will also file these uh, books of financial financial statements of the subsidiaries which are outside India. Their financial statements are also attached with. The company's financial statements are filed to the ROC, and this X X B R L is extensive business uh, reporting language. In this particular format, it is necessary for certain companies to file their documents to the ROC. Okay, so the uh, it is with the following classes of companies should file their financial statements and other documents under Section one thirty seven to the ROC in the specific form E form A O C three X B R L. For which companies it is mandatory is Companies which are listed with stock exchanges of in India and in and their Indian subsidiaries, and companies having paid up share capital more than or equal to five crores, company having turnover more than or equal to hundred crores. For all such companies, they need to prepare these particular financial statements and file the documents to the ROC in X B R L format. What is the need? Why they need to submit in this particular format? Because once they are filed to the ROC, then it would become a public document. And if any other similar company which is doing similar kind of business so for example uh, there is a tire manufacturing company which had filed its documents and financial statements uh, in xprl format to roc if the similar type of company want to um, check the financial position of that particular company and to have a comparative analysis with other companies uh, are doing similar business in such cases this particular format uh, will facilitate or will provide uh, for the outside public or for anybody to have a comparative analysis of uh, one company's financial position with the other company's financial position so that's why it is mandatory for the below said companies like companies listed with stock exchanges having paid up share capital with more than or equal to 5 crores uh, or companies having turnover uh, with more than or equal to 100 crores mandatory for them to file uh, uh, the financial statements in this particular specific format okay and however nbfcs housing finance companies and companies engaged in the business of banking and insurance it is not a compulsory they are exempted okay so these are the things how this xprl uh, format is necessary for the companies to file their documents to the roc okay now next suppose before going for reopening this we'll go for the voluntary uh, uh, revision of the financial statements see what is meant by voluntary revision of the financial statements madam suppose if the board of directors 
think that they could not prepare the financial statements to the true and fair view. They did not prepare and they did not give the true and accurate information in the financial statements. In such cases, the directors of the company on their own motion, and if they think that they could not comply with the few of the accounting standards which are necessary to apply. Uh, in such cases, what they do, they on their own, they will try to rectify these financial statements, prepare a revised financial statements and revised board reports. Uh, revision can be done for three preceding financial years okay so uh, this is called as voluntary revision uh, uh, voluntary revision of the financial statements and the board report under section 131 of the company side what the board of in this particular case the board of directors will think that they have not properly complied with accounting standards and their, their financial statements are not in the true and correct picture in such cases they can revise the financial statements for the preceding three financial years and they can also revise their board report once the revision of the financial statements is done and revision of the board report is done the same should again be filed to roc and the same again should be read in the agm for the information to the members and the copies of it have to be delivered to the members of the company okay this is a very this is called as voluntary revision of the financial statements however once in, in in one financial year the financial statements can be revised only once not more than once okay so revised financial statement is also important and revised board report is also necessary however in some cases uh, uh, there will be reopening of these, uh, uh, reopening of the accounts as per the order of the court or a criminal. One, a company should reopen its books of accounts uh, and financial statements on orders it received from the uh, tribunal. Okay. The relevant, in such particular cases, uh, the court will order the company on, on, the, on the information they get from either the member of the company or from any order of central government uh, or from any other financial institutions. In such cases, uh, it is mandatory for the company to reopen its books of accounts. And get and, re and revise this particular uh, uh, financial statement. You open the financial statement and get audited once again. In such cases, uh, uh, the uh, in for the purpose of uh, uh, reopening, they can reopen uh, the books of accounts for a maximum of eight financial years immediately preceding the current financial year. To so how many years they can reopen the books of accounts? The maximum of eight financial year immediately immediately preceding the current financial. Year. Who are eligible to apply for the central government uh, for the purpose of? Uh, sorry, who will apply to the tribunal for the purpose of reopening? The central government may ask the uh, tribunal, uh, insisting the tribunal to ask the company, so and so company for reopening of its books of accounts. And for income tax authorities may make an application. Say we can make an application or any other statutory body or any other person concerned relating to the company who might be a member or any other financial institutions. On the request of their may made by the tribunal, on the request made to the tribunal, the tribunal will ask the company to reopen. They can be reopened to the maximum of eight years. Books of accounts can be reopened open to a maximum period of eight years okay so these both are very very important voluntary revision of books of accounts and reopening of the books of accounts are completely two different topics okay so i have already told you along with the financial statements the board of directors should also give their board report what are what are the contents of the board report ma'am generally according to the rule eight of the company act, the board the board will contain the following details Under section 134, the board will contain the following details. What are those? Ma'am, the board will contain that they have properly filed the annual return, that the information of the annual financial statements are prepared, the annual returns have to be filed to ROC. It also contains number of board meetings which have taken place, the director's responsibility statements, and uh, about the independent declarations of the independent directors and qualifications and remarks made by the auditors about the loans and investments and about the company's um, uh, technology, foreign exchange earnings, uh, and any material changes. So all these are important contents of the board report. Uh, and finally, the board report should also be signed by the chairperson who is authorized by the board. And if he is not, if he is not authorized, it is signed by two directors, and at least one director should be a managing director of the company. Compulsory, once the board have uh, prepared according to the provisions of the company and board report have been prepared, it should be signed either by the chairperson authorized by the board or at least by two directors in that one director should be a managing directors. 
and what are the these are the director's responsibility statement that they should will include in this particular statement statement itself says the director's responsibility statements they say that they every year they are responsible for preparing the annual accounts of the company and they prepare by complying to the laws rules and regulations specified in the companies act and they also comply to the uh, accounting standards which are levied for that particular company and uh, they will the sufficient necessary care is taken for the maintenance of the uh, financial Uh, statements and for reflection of the true and fair uh, view of the uh, financial statements and the financial statements are prepared independently without any influence of any other third party so these are the important aspects of the director's responsibility statement so with this these are the few important provisional points which you all have to keep in mind uh, relating to work companies books of accounts so first how these provisions which like what are the basic important provisions which first one books of accounts what are the books of accounts and where they are kept uh, next uh, who Who are responsible? Uh, well, who are responsible inspecting the books of accounts? And once the books of accounts have been prepared, they should be uh, get audited by the auditor before uh, um, laying in the AGM. Uh, and say the who are responsible for signing these uh, financial statements? Then voluntary revision of the books of accounts, reopening of the books of accounts. We have seen these so many provisions relating to all these aspects. And finally, what is a board report? What is director director's responsibility statement? So in the AGM, what are the things you will lay before the The shareholders are will will lay audited financial statements, board report, audit report, and all the other necessary documents are laid before the uh, shareholders, uh, which reflects which will specifically tell the financial position of the company. If the books of accounts are not prepared by the on the day of the AGM, the AGM will be adjourned for the sake of adoption of the financial statement. Okay. So the next very very important concept is uh, corporate social responsibility under section one thirty five of the Company Act. Ma'am, what is this corporate social responsibility? The word itself tells. See, generally, come as we all know, company. Companies are very important for the economic growth of the country. So, if a country have to grow progressively, um, and if the company have to create lots of employment opportunities, uh, companies have to be existed in India. Okay, in such cases, uh, it's an equal responsibility of the company to also give back something to the society because uh, it is in the society. Companies established in the society it is manufacturing in the society. They have set up its uh, industries in the society, and it is using the land, air, water of the society. So. It is it is a basic responsibility for the company to give back something to the society because it is making money from the people. Okay, you can say, ma'am, there are, there are there are investments are happening. The people are investing in that. Again, why you how do you say that it is taking the money from the public because without this pub without the public or without the society there is no purpose for a companies to exist. Okay, so if we have everyone are interrelated and interdependent. Okay, mutually dependent on each other. So what the company sector says. Is it is mandatory and responsible for all these big companies, which are listed public limited companies, uh, to uh, contribute out of their profits every year for the development of the society. In what way they can contribute? It is specifically mentioned in the Schedule Seven of the Company Act. Uh, what are activities are considered for the development of the uh, for the uh, considered as a corporate social responsibility activities like uh, like uh, creating an uh, infrastructure facilities uh, for the society or hospitals uh, or educational. facilities or encouraging certain uh, class of uh, uh, public so all these things are or creating awareness about uh, covid vaccine or something like that in general when we browse like uh, the Uh, Google will know what the Reliance company have their own foundation. Reliance foundation, like Tata companies have their own foundation, which specifically they form a special committees uh, or uh, separate institutes exclusively uh, for the purpose of carrying out this corporate social responsibility. Even the foreign companies in India, if they are having subsidies in India, they will also try to do this corporate social responsible activities. Like for example, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft have its own NGO organization in India, like Bill Gates, uh, Bill Gates Foundation, which which are responsible for Carrying out the social responsibility activities, but however, companies according to CSR policy rules 2014, the companies act has made mandatory for the following uh, companies uh, to conduct the social responsibility activities in India. Every company, including its holding or subsidiary or a foreign company, which is defined under Section 2, Subsection 42 of the Companies Act, having branch offices or projects in India and having network which consists the network rupees of 500 crores or more, turnover of 1000 crores or more. 
or net profit of five crores or more during immediately preceding financial year. In such cases, those corporates should form a separate committee. Called as corporate social responsibility committee. What is this committee, ma'am? This is nothing but a part of board of directors. The board of directors. The, suppose if the company is having six board of directors, among that three board of directors will form a separate committee, which is called a CSR committee. Their duty is to see that every year, whatever come, whatever amount is being invested in this particular social, uh, CSR policies and programs, they are properly implemented and verified. Okay, so they will formulate the policies and programs, and the implementation part also they will take. So this corporate uh, social responsibility committee is mandatory in India for so these uh, respective companies who fulfill these uh, all limitations like net worth uh, rupees of five hundred crores or more, turnover of thousand crores or more, and net profit of five crores or more. Okay, and compulsorily in their committee there should be an independent director who is not at all related to the company and um, uh, who is independent uh, uh, for the uh, from the management of the company. Okay, in the committee of uh, social responsibility, company social responsibility. Responsibility. There should be one independent director. And if suppose the company spending uh, does not exceed fifty lakh rupees, uh, in such cases the company need not form a separate co corporate social responsibility committee. The board of directors themselves can manage these social activities. Okay. This is only in case of companies who spend who, who does not increase fifty lakh rupees. In such cases, they need not have any separate committees. Okay. Now. Independent directors are nothing but central government will prescribe these independent directors for certain. They should be mandatory independent director for certain class of companies uh, whose paid up share cap is ten crores or more, turnover is hundred crores or more, and having an out a, a company is having an a, uh, outstanding loans, debentures, and deposits of fifty crores or more. In such cases, uh, the company will ask uh, uh, the every listed company should have at least one third of number of directors as independent directors. This is very very another important point uh, under section one forty nine four of the company. Is act in case of a listed public company. And second, I'm telling in case of listed public company, out of the total number of directors, one third of the directors should be independent directors. Okay, so out of the total number of directors, one third should be an independent directors. In such case, in such listed companies are having, a, uh, I mean, like paid up share capital of ten crores or more, turnover of hundred crores or more, or uh, their outstanding loans, debentures, and deposits exceed fifty crores or more, they should mandatorily maintain independent. Why, ma'am, independent directors? Because independent the judgment given by the independent directors would be too in fair view. They would not rely on the decisions of the management, or they would not try to give the wrong uh, information to the outside public. And they should also disclose the same about the CSR committee and about the CSR activities in the board report and what and then about their duties should also be specified. Okay, now. How much amount every year? How much amount this particular companies have to spend, ma'am, for CSR activities? The board every year should ensure that they spend minimum or at least two percentage of average and profits of the preceding three financial years. Okay, how much amount they should spend? At least two percentage of average net profits of the in preceding three financial years. Or if the company have not completed three financial years, sir, like preceding three years, you can generally generally say that the preceding financial year it should not be. Less than two percentage of average net profits of preceding three years. If the company have not completed three years, then average then the it is nothing but at least two percentage of the profits of the preceding year. Okay, now, ma'am, uh, like uh, what are for what all activities the company have to spend its uh, CSR uh, uh, money which the company have collected uh, from out of the net profits? The company should spend that amount as per the activities which are specified by the Companies Act under Schedule Seven of the. Companies Act, okay, and and within a period of six months from the end of the financial year, within how much time the company have to spend, ma'am? Within a period of six months from the end of financial year, company have to spend their prescribed amount which they have collected exclusively for corporate social responsibility for the activities which are specified in Schedule Seven of the Companies Act, and the company should give first preference to their local areas and surrounding areas for spending the amount, okay? Under CSR policy, the company should use a Particular amount for the local areas and uh, the related area nearby areas for spending that particular amount. Okay, and one more point, ma'am. After in that particular uh, amount which the company have uh, you uh, collected for corporate social responsibility, if there is any amount remaining, the company again should not take back, nor again should use for their uh, business purposes. The company should transfer this particular amount to the separate account called as for unpaid corporate social responsibility account and utilize the amount for further projects. Okay. But the company should not 
use that particular amount again for their business okay so these are very 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 important points relating to the corporate social responsibilities however uh, the company should uh, use this purpose for the for the welfare of the society for the benefit of the society and for benefit of the public or improving or creating an infrastructure facilities spending csr funds for carrying out awareness programs regarding vaccination as i have already told you setting up a uh, hospital so for as for the covid facilities and uh, medical storage of oxygen so storage plants all these stuff the companies can do as the contributions for the covid but how are the following are not considered as csr acts very 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 important the following are not come Uh, if these activities the company contributes the money to these activities they are not considered as csr activities what are those activities ma'am activities which are undertaken outside india if they are not first preference i have already told you know the csr activities for the amount the company should spend for the in their local areas however the company is spending the amount outside india or company is uh, using that amount for political party purpose or the company is using uh, the amount for the normal business activities or the company is using for the benefit of the employees are uh, giving an advertisement or sponsorship programs for tv programs and charitable institutions or contributing to charitable institutions in such cases uh, they are not called as csr activities please try to remember all these points which are very 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 important from the examination perspective in this particular part also they will ask you a practical question like how ma'am suppose for example company is constructing a school and college for the benefit of the um, children of the employees can you consider it as a csr activity no this is not a csr activity if the amount is spent for the benefit of the employees and their families it is not a csr activity or the company is contributing amount to a charitable institution no or company is sponsoring a tv program no and com- company is contributing to a political party no or fulfilling for legal requirements no or company is con- donating amount for the people outside india who are suffering like ukraine um, citizens for the citizens of ukraine because of recent war those are not considered as csr activities because they does not fall the category of schedule 7 of the company act okay so very important topic csr next one last one for in this particular topic is internal audit for every company there are two types of audits internal audit and extra statutory audit internal audit is very important um, the company generally appoints an internal auditor uh, to check verify whether the company is uh, properly maintaining books of accounts at regular intervals of time uh, and see whether the tra- whether the uh, company is preparing the books according to the accounting standards and rules and regulations applicable to such companies okay so if the following companies are and it is mandatory for the following companies to appoint an internal auditor so every listed companies for every listed company it is mandatory there are no limits and in case of public in case of unlisted public companies uh, having paid up share capital of 50 crores or more during the preceding financial year, Year, turnover of two crores or or turnover of two crores or more during the financial year, or if their outstandings and loans borrowing from public private institutions exceed hundred crores or more at any point of time during the preceding financial year, or their deposits exceed twenty five crores or more at any point during the preceding financial year, or a private company, or in this is for. public companies unlisted it is mandatory for all listed public companies and for unlisted public companies this criteria and other than uh, public companies for private companies uh, having turnover of 200 crores or more in the preceding financial year or outstanding loans borrowing from banks and financial institutions 100 crores or more in the preceding financial for them it is mandatory to appoint internal auditor if internal auditor is appointed uh, the respective necessary checks the internal controls would be strong and the deviations would be less and company pre- would uh, effectively prepare the financial statements uh, to uh, which which can is a correct and true information now who is this internal auditor might be a chartered accountant or a cost accountant or any other uh, professional person for the conducting internal activities and here the term chartered accountant means chartered accountants engaged in practice or not internal auditor may or may not be an employee to the company okay so these are the very important aspects relating to the internal audit of the company under section 138 with this uh, we have done with the chartered accounts of the company okay so these are the main important topics relating to the company side next we will see next we will char- start this particular new uh, chapter of uh, i mean like ni act with this we completed the uh, um companies act and we are going to start with the ni act okay so it's very very important from the examination perspective we will get around 10 to 15 marks uh, in from ni act okay first uh, today in today's class i will tell you all the basics of ni act basics of ni act will be covered in this particular topic
so as we all know out of in companies act we would get around 60 marks and for ni act uh, you have 10 you are you are covered about 10 to 12 marks or 15 marks accordingly and at the same way you have indian contract act general process and interpretations of statutes these are other acts okay now let us come to this particular chapter of negotiable instrument act ma'am what is this negotiable instrument act why is it so important this negotiable instrument act 1881 is the oldest act which is applicable generally in many countries uh, around the world okay so around the world many countries will follow this particular negotiable instrument act okay this particular negotiable instrument act for us in india is applicable to the whole of india and ni act is applicable to whole of india ma'am what's the importance and purpose of this act ma'am the preamble is nothing but the purpose and the objective of this particular act ma'am the objective of this act is to facilitate Facilitate credit trading for the business people. Okay, it will it will it will help it facilitate to generally every transaction you need you need to have a cash or liquidity. So sometimes that we don't have the cash or liquidity. In such cases, a uh, negotiable instrument uh, is uh, nothing but a document which is having some value to it and which is expressed in terms of money. Okay, this particular negotiable instrument is important for the business organizations for the doing business on credit basis. okay now and mandatorily the negotiable instrument should be a written document it in what, what document it is written document in this particular topic also you have practical questions you have theoretical questions and you also have a case law type of questions okay and negotiable instrument act is nothing but a document which is having some value to it negotiability means transferability and such document can be transferred n number of times until the principal debtor makes the payment okay so how many times a negotiable instrument can be you can say ma'am um, there is specific due date no how can we say that it can be endorsed n number of times after due date can't be endorsed the negotiable instrument ma'am yes you can transfer even after the due date okay even after the due date the negotiable instrument can be transferred so that is why i am telling you it will be transferred n number of times until the principal debtor makes the payment on this particular negotiable instrument okay so negotiability means transferability instrument means a document having a value to it that is why it is called as a negotiable instrument and uh, it this particular negotiable instrument the rupee the uh, the, uh, the money the currency the coins and rupees which are printed by rbi you cannot call them as a negotiable instrument they are not termed as negotiable instrument they does not fall under the definition of negotiable instrument so once again i am telling you the rupees the coins which are printed by rbi even though you can say ma'am on that particular rupee note uh, there is specifically mentioned that uh, uh, like i promised to pay so you can be called is negotiable instrument no according to the provisions of ni act the rupees and coins does are not called as a negotiable instrument and hundis for hundis we have heard this particular term hundis hundis is one type of bill of exchange in olden days they used to use and as of now for hundis are guided by their local language local customs and practices according to the local language of that particular place ni act is not applicable to hundis but however if there is no local custom and practices rules and regulations for conducting the hundis the only then ni act would be applicable this particular point they would ask for the bit so please listen carefully next last one so what are the things which are come fall under the definition of ni act ma'am what are the different instruments which fall under, fall under the definition of ni act ma'am the instruments which fall under the definition of ni act are negotiable instrument here means a promissory note bill of exchange and check okay so now once again i am telling you the following uh, points uh, uh, the following instruments which fall under the definition of negotiable instrument are promissory note bill of exchange and check whether the payable to order or the bearer of the instrument okay so before entering this i will tell you in detail the basics of what is a promissory note what is a bill of exchange what is a check first let me give a clarity on this so that you will understand when we discuss on this particular uh, various things first let me tell you promissory note what is a promissory note when this particular promissory note is prepared who are the parties of the promissory note 
Generally, when a person, when he goes, when he bring in need of money, he will approach a bank or he will approach a third person who will provide him with the loan. The person who wants this particular loan is called as debtor or the borrower. Okay. So the person who wants the loan, if at all you are paid students, if you're having a running notes, please try to draft this particular information, what I am, what I am telling. Okay. The person who is having uh, who wants money or who want to borrow the money can borrow the money from a bank or any other uh, individual who offers him the loan and the person is called as a principal debtor or the borrower okay however at the time of borrowing uh, you cannot morally say you can morally say that i would pay this particular amount on so and so date with so and so interest that would not be valid as a legal proof later if the uh, principal debtor fails to make the payment in such cases uh, a promise promissory note is drafted or a promissory note is bought by the particular borrower and he's drafting or he'll write on the promissory note that I promise to pay so and so amount with so and so interest after so and so, so many number of days or months okay who will draft this particular promissory note the person who is borrowing the money or who want the loan who is borrower will prepare will make this promissory note that is why he is called as maker of the promissory note who is called as a maker of the promissory note the principal debtor is called as a maker of the promissory note he have to give that is why they say that all the negotiable instruments should mandatorily be in a written form only written form is valid all the negotiable instruments should be mandatory in a written form. Therefore, the promissory note is prepared by the maker. He will prepare the promissory note. He will sign the promissory note. And this particular promissory note, after signing up, he will hand over it to the creditor who have given him the money. Therefore, the creditor is called as a payee of the promissory note. Okay, so now understand. Now I hope everyone understood. In promissory note, there are two parties that is maker and the payee. Maker is a principal debtor who borrows the money, payee is a creditor who lends the money. Therefore, maker is preparing the promissory note. There he is called as principal debtor, and his signature is important on the promissory note. Without his signature, the promissory note is not valid. Therefore, whose signature is important on the promissory note? Maker's signature is important on the promissory note okay now this is all about a promissory how many parties are there two parties maker and pay now let's come to a bill of exchange you know what is a bill first of all okay i hope everyone have this particular idea of bill okay bill of exchange or a bill Bill is nothing but when we go for a shop or for purchasing few things or when we go for the shopping, then we then bill is prepared by the seller and he gives us bill accordingly. We pay him cash. Okay, so we pay him cash. We take the bill, we take the goods and come back as a customer from shopping. But however, if bill is made on credit basis and if payment is not made immediately, then it is called as bill of exchange. Generally, bill is prepared by the seller. But payment is not made immediately. It is prepared on credit basis. So that you will make the payment on a later date. Okay. In such cases, it is called as a bill of exchange. Generally, um, generally for the credit, the debt, if there is any relationship or if there, the creditor knows the debtor, uh, he, he gives that particular uh, goods or credit to the debtor. So that the debtor will later on a specific date, uh, as he mentioned in that particular bill, he will make the payment okay the person who is buying the goods is called as a the person who is buying the goods is called as a drawee in this case who will buy the goods he is a principal debtor on later date he have to make the payment in case of a bill of exchange who will make the who will make the payment the principal debtor who buys the goods okay the person from whom the goods are bought that is the seller of the, the seller he is the person who will prepare the bill you all know, no, obviously, when you go to the shops, who will prepare the bill? The seller will prepare the bill. Okay. So, now, that particular draw, drawer is a person who will draw the bill or prepare the bill. He is nothing but the seller. Okay. He is a creditor. He will prepare the bill saying that, uh, respective to Mr. X, the goods are sold worth of rupees 5 lakhs, payable after three, 3 months with an interest of 12%. And he will prepare that particular bill and he will show it to the buyer, Mr. X. Yes. 
So once the buyer sees that particular bill, he accepts with the contents which are written in the bill. Okay, he accepts. That's whatever contents you have written are true, correct. To my knowledge, as I purchased five lakh worth of goods, which I am going to pay three months after date, and with an interest of twelve percent. Okay, now tell me. In this particular case, the seller is a drawer who is preparing the bill. The drawee is nothing but a buyer who will sign the bill. Whose signature is important in case of a bill of exchange? The drawee's signature. That is the buyer who will sign that particular instrument and give it to the seller. Now, who is the holder of the instrument? The drawer is the holder of the instrument. After three months, when the drawee or when the buyer comes back, he should show the instrument. Then only he will make the payment. Okay, who have to show the instrument here? The drawer, the seller. If he shows the instrument, okay, as you mentioned it, as you have specified that you would make the payment on this particular instrument. So please make the payment. On the due date, okay. Then the buyer have to make the payment. Okay, this is the general information regarding the promissory note and bill of exchange. So once again, I will tell you, in case of a promissory note, there are two parties. Who are the two parties? Ah, uh, the maker and the payee. Maker is nothing but a principal debtor who will prepare the promissory note and who will sign the promissory note. After preparing and signing the promissory note, he will hand over this negotiable instrument to the payee, who is the holder of the negotiable instrument. In case of bill of exchange, there are two parties: seller and the buyer. Seller is nothing but the drawer who will prepare the bill. Okay, buyer is the person after seeing contents of the uh, bill, he will sign the bill that he would make the payment on so and so date, and later hand over this bill to the drawer. Now, therefore, drawer is the holder of the instrument in case of a bill of exchange. Okay, so these are the two different things, like uh, in case of a uh, bill or in case of a uh, promissory. Now these are the general. Now what about check? Check I will tell you later on. Now as now you be thorough with the promissory note and all. Then check I will tell you uh, afterwards. Okay. Now the what are the important characteristic features of a negotiable instrument? The term negotiability is import is is there for all the three negotiable instruments. Okay. It is there for a bill. It is there for a promissory note. It is there for a check. Okay. For all the three, there are these characteristics are applicable, and they are freely transferable from one person to other person either by delivery or by endorsement and delivery. Okay, so by endorsement and delivery also the instrument is being transferred. What is delivery? What is difference between delivery and endorsement and delivery? I will tell you. How many times it will be transferred? The instrument can be transferred n number of times even after the maturity date until the principal debtor makes the payment. Who is the principal debtor, ma'am? In case of a promissory note, the principal debtor is the maker who will sign the instrument. Okay. In case of a bill of exchange, the principal debtor is drawee, that is a buyer who will buy the goods on credit. Okay. Until these people make the payment, the instrument can be endorsed or transferred n number of times. Okay. Now, what is meant by delivery, ma'am? So once generally the maker after preparing the promissory note and signing the promissory note, he will deliver it to the pay. That is full delivery. At the initial stage when it happens, in case of bill of exchange, once the drawer have prepared the bill and they hand over to drawer for his signature after drawer accepting the bill and signing the instrument, he will deliver it to the drawer. That is called as delivery. Then what is endorsement and delivery, ma'am? Suppose for example, in case of a bill of exchange, the drawer who is the holder of the instrument. Okay, who is having the value of negotiable instrument in his hands, but he need money urgently now because of meeting some personal expenditure or personal emergency. In such cases, sir, he can endorse the instrument to third party. Okay, so when he when the drawer is endorsing the instrument to the third party, what he can do on the back of the instrument as an endorser or as a transferer, he will sign the instrument and he will do endorsement and delivery to the third party. Then only he can take money on the particular instrument. Understood? Now what the? I mean, uh, uh, what to say? The drawer will do. What the drawer will do at the time of endorsement? He will. Ah, uh, since he is the holder of the instrument and he want the money immediately, he can't wait until for three months to be completed. Then he will on the behind that particular instrument, he will sign, he will endorse, and he will transfer it. That particular transferring of the instrument is called endorsement and delivery to the other party. 
after taking the amount on our consideration on that particular negotiable instrument okay so that is an important is called as an endorsement and deal next such instrument should be free from all the defects what are defects madam what would be the defects you cannot take the negotiable instrument by theft right some other negotiable instrument you cannot use it or for the negotiable instruments you cannot use it in such cases if you use them they are having the defective title they don't have good title so negotiable instrument he should have a good title then only the holder can get a claim over the instrument and he can claim money in a correct way then only he will be called as holder in due course holder in due course means the word holder in due course will use when a holder takes the instrument in good faith per consideration before maturity then only you will call use this particular term holder in due course for that particular person okay understood when do you use this particular term holder in due course use a particular word holder in due course to a person when he use the instrument in good faith per consideration before maturity then if any damages happen then he can sue the prior party so these are few important uh, uh, characteristics of a uh, negotiable instrument now let's come let i have already told you there are three types of negotiable instrument promissory note under section 4 bill of exchange under section 5 check under section 6 now we have already men, uh, discussed about promissory note and bill of exchange and who are the parties for the promissory note and bill of exchange okay now let's come to the definition under section 4 of the company side promissory note is an instrument in writing not being a bank note or a currency note containing an unconditional order or undertaking and it is signed by the maker to pay certain sum of money to the order or a person specified or to the bearer of the instrument okay so very 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 important point which you need to understand this the definition is same for all the three it's an instrument promissory note is an instrument having value and it should be compulsorily in writing form as i have already told you it is not a banking note or a currency note and it contains an unconditional order and it is signed by the maker who will sign the promissory note and only after his signature the promissory note is valid who will sign maker will sign and the amount which is specified in the promissory note should also be certain it cannot be uncertain or approximate amount for example if you have borrowed 5 lakhs you should specify 5 lakhs along with the interest of 18% but you cannot say well, i think it is a 4 lakhs 98000 approximately there is no approximate amount or uncertain amount you should exactly mention the amount and if you have to pay to certain person to the order or the pay you will mention i promise to pay so and so sum to mr x or if you don't write mr x you can leave it as a bank then it blank then it will be called as a bearer instrument or if you specify the name then it is called as an order instrument to mr x or his order then it will be called as a order instrument for example mr ram executes a promissory note and in the following form i promise to pay sum of rupees 20000 after 5 months is it valid or not yes because here clearly they are saying that i promise to pay i acknowledge my indebtedness all these terms if they use then it is a valid promissory note okay so this is the this is the way how the promissory note will be uh, the generally they will prepare okay no care it should be mandatory in writing i have already told you and the amount should be definite and i strong the amount should be definite and certain and it is signed by the maker okay there should not be any conditions like i think i promise i will i promise to pay sum of 20000 to mr x after mr x get value uh, get uh, after mr x uh, marriage with z you cannot keep any such conditions if the conditions are there then immediately holder should reject those conditions should not accept those conditions okay the condition should not be accepted by the holder of the instrument okay and here promise to pay money only here it cannot be in terms of kind you cannot make payment anything other than money compulsorily it is mandatorily you need to pay money only okay what they are saying you should pay money you need you cannot pay a bike or a car or a watch or any uh, horse instead of money mandatorily the entire amount should be in money form only okay so these are the important characteristic features of a promissory note okay now what are they what are like for example i promise to pay balu or order rupees 500 as it is valid because it is really missing i acknowledge my indebtedness of 1000 be paid on demand uh, for the value received it was valid uh, mr balu i owe you means i i am indebted to you rupees 1000 this is not valid because it i have not clearly mentioned in this particular case it is not at all mentioned properly that mr balu is indebted i promise to pay uh, 
uh, 7 lakh uh, 10,000 rupees to Mr. Balu after three months. Is it valid or not? Yes, it is valid because here specifically mentioning the amount and uh, time. I promised pay Balu rupees 500 and uh, rupees 2500 and also deliver him my black box on 1st January next year. What uh, the year? This is not a valid year. Sorry, I have mentioned it as yes. No, it's not a valid promissory you note know, because in this particular case, uh, they are in, they are what they are saying uh, along with the money, they are also giving the black box and in kind the amount should not be paid. Bank data should be paid in cash. Okay, so X promises Y to pay 10,000 uh, six months after his marriage with Z. So, this is also not a valid promissory. Here, in this particular case, only one condition is valid which should be valid. I, I promise to pay uh, rupees 10,000 after my grandfather's death. That is the only condition which is valid in the promissory note according to the provisions of Negotiable Instrument Act. Other, the, other than that, if you give any other condition have been specified, which is invalid. Okay. Now, let us come to the Bill of Exchange under section until now we have seen the promissory note so the promissory note are to maker and payee maker is the debtor who borrows the money pay is the creditor who gives the money and maker signature is important on the promissory note and he will prepare the promissory note and he will hand over it to the payee pay is the person who holds the promissory note and if he want he can also endorse the promissory note therefore he is the holder of the promissory note now let's come to the bill of exchange under section 5 in case of bill of exchange under section 5 bill of exchange there are two parties drawer and drawee the drawer is the seller who will prepare the bill. Roy is the buyer who will sign the bill, accept the bill and sign and he will deliver that particular bill to the drawer. The drawer is the holder of the bill. He can keep under the due date with himself or he want he can endorse it to some other party. Therefore, here bill of instrument, bill of exchange is also an instrument, same definition in the same format. Bill of exchange is also an instrument in writing containing an unconditional order signed by the maker here instead of maker what you have to say signed by the drawee who will sign the bill of exchange the drawee after after uh, verif verifying the things which are written by the seller the drawee will sign the particular instrument directing certain person to pay certain sum of money or not to the bearer of the instrument so this is also same in same way it has been writing to pay certain sum of money and money should always be money from no kind and it is signed by the drawee these are the important characteristic features of a, a bill okay so this is the format of a bill can we endorse this instrument yes we can endorse until until the principal data makes a payment that is for the bill of exchange drawer drawee and pay drawer means the person the seller who will prepare the bill drawee on whom the bill is prepared that is who is that is nothing but the buyer and whose signature is important on a bill and if the drawer holds the uh, bill until the due date he will also be called as payee or the holder of the instrument if he cannot hold the bill until the due date what he can do if you want he can endorse the instrument when he endorses that particular instrument uh, uh, to mr uh, uh, x then the x mr x or any other the endorser would be called as a payee or the holder of the instrument and if you want he can keep with himself under the due date or he can also endorse the instrument okay now before going for this particular acceptance of the bill uh, i will just specify i will tell you whose acceptance is important in case of a bill of exchange uh, the drawee's acceptance is important in the time of bill of exchange so initially drawee will accept when he's signing the instrument to the drawer so once the instrument is uh, prepared and the instrument is endorsed to the third party and the third party on the due date if he comes to this particular respect to draw or the buyer who promised who, who ensured that he would make the payment on the due date and present the instrument asking for payment that is called presentment for acceptance when the third party or the endorsee or the payee or the holder of the instrument present the instrument before the maturity for his acceptance whether he would make the payment on the due date or not that is called as presentment for acceptance in such cases if the drawee of a bill of exchange accepts the bill with some conditions that is called called as qualified acceptance okay so in, please remember one, one more time i'm telling you what is this particular qualified acceptance when the drawee of a bill of exchange accepts the bill for the purpose of payment with some conditions when it is presented by the payee it is called as qualified or conditional acceptance therefore what the negotiable instrument act is saying on the safer side for the payee or the holder of the instrument it is asking the payee or the holder not to accept the condition specified by the drawee just to dishonor the bill
okay so what the uh, uh, nai act is uh, uh, giving instructions to the holder of the pay it is saying that please don't accept the conditions uh, given by the drawee if you accept for the conditions uh, the prior parties would be discharged from their liability okay therefore you should wait only until the drawee makes the payment therefore what you have to do when such conditions or when such qualifications are kept by the drawee then immediately prepare a no not notice of dishonor or dishonor notice and give it to the prior parties and make them also liable on the instrument to receive the payment so what kind of conditions can be kept by the drawee the drawee can say that he would make only part payment the drawee can say that you come to a specific place then only i'll make payment or drawee can say that i he need some extra time please extend the due date or please extend the time limit if such conditions are kept by the drawee on the presentment of a bill uh, before making payment uh, the holders the payees or the endors if please don't accept for such conditions if you accept for such conditions the prior parties would be discharged from the liability so just uh, then in such case then you say i am not going to accept your conditions therefore i will dishonor the bill and give the notice of dishonor to the prior parties and make them all liable on the instrument this is very important for the practical question then it is also called as qualified acceptance okay this qualified acceptance is there only in case of a bill of exchange okay so this is all about the acceptance acceptance is made by the drawee in case of a bill of exchange so these are the important points relating to the bill of exchange now what are the general differences between a promissory note and a bill of exchange in case of promissory note uh, it's an unconditional promise to pay it contains an unconditional order to the uh, by the drawee to pay certain sum of money to the order or the bearer of the instrument here there are two parties here there are three parties here the maker position is debtor and who will sign the instrument the drawee is a creditor and who directs the drawee to pay therefore the drawee will sign the buyer will sign this particular instrument okay uh, so uh, here the promissory note is not drawn in such bills of exchange are drawn in such notice of no need to give the notice of dishonor notice of dishonor is, is there in case to give to the intermediate parties or uh, immediate parties and um, here in both cases it can never be conditional sir and these are few important points relating to the promissory note in a bill of exchange very very important basic informations under negotiable instrument act okay so next before discussing a check today i will give you a i'll give you a small briefing about the check you all know checks you know when do we use checks so generally we use checks for the purpose of making payment okay when we have a bank account with some respect to bank they give us a checkbook this checkbook can can be in a physical form or in an electronic form in both ways checkbook will be there in physical form on or electronic form once the check is given to us if we want to make any payments for any purchases of any assets or for purchase of any electronic goods if you want or to make payment of salaries if you want to make um, uh, i mean to say payments then we use the check okay then we the person who is making the payment by using the check are called as the drawer or the debtor okay so please remember the person who uses the check for the purpose of a payment is called drawer of the check and he draws and he signs the check he write the details and he signs the check and he is also called as principal debtor in case of a check and the person to whom the particular check is given the creditor for whom to the pay, payment have to be made the creditor is called as a payee of the check and we and sub and which bank's check we are using that bank is called as a drawee or drawer's bank okay therefore in check you have three parties drawer drawee and payee drawer is the person who have to make the payment therefore a principal debtor and is making payment through the bank that is by using a check the bank which is making payment or paying bank on behalf drawer is called drawee the person who will receive the check and who will encash the money and for whom the payment have to be made the creditor is called as the payee okay so these are the very very important points relating to the negotiable instrument in case of a check and this particular check aspect will continue in tomorrow's class and tomorrow we'll continue with the negotiable instrument act thank you so much for listening uh, patiently and see you tomorrow take care bye bye